This is lecture 13. We skipped lecture 12. Uh, so this is kind of lecture 12, but we're going to call it lecture 13. So what we uh, want to do in this set of uh, in this lecture is to get ready for experiment 5. So experiment 5 is a matter of adding two more modules and then putting all those modules together and having that the, the resulting computer execute a program. And so that's our goal. We'll talk more about that in a second. And we'll also do some example problems here. So we have to get down to the nitty gritty here and see how computers implement instructions. So we've talked about instructions. We've written a bunch of programs. Uh, now it's time to see how those instructions are actually implemented on hardware. So a computer is essentially a giant circuit. It, it sequences through uh, various instructions in the program, essentially which means the instructions are essentially passing data around the hardware. Okay, and it does it in such a way, of course, to retain, to obtain a useful result. We'll have to read that off there. So essentially what happens is the 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 passing around of that data per instruction is not done in one clock cycle. It's done in more than one clock cycle, we'll say. And the idea is that it can't really do everything in one clock cycle. Essentially, that means uh, we got a lot of synchronous circuits that are passing data around. We just simply can't do it in one um, clock cycle. So there's multiple clock cycles. And I, I learned these as T cycles. I think every architecture is going to call it something different. Every book has a different name for it, but it's the, the notion's the same. Your computer doesn't do everything at once when it's executing an instruction. It breaks it up into chunks. Okay, so every, every architecture, every different computer you look at out there is going to have different amount, different architecture, of course, it's going to have different amount of T cycles. It's just going to do things in a different way. So uh, typically we call these uh, these chunks cycles. Um, you'll see that they're actually states of a state machine. But two most uh, popular cycles out there in the big world are fetch and execute cycles. There are other cycles depending upon the hardware, such as we are write, read, write back, wait. And so these are these have contextual de definitions. Uh, you can't take them too literally. Like we will talk about write back in a second here for one of our instructions, but have to realize that we are working with risk 5 Each instruction requires two clock cycles, which is um, a fetch and an execute. But you'll see that one instruction requires, one type of instruction requires three clock cycles, which is a, a fetch, execute, and a write back, and we'll look at that in a second. So in the big scheme of things, when people say, hey, my computer's running at this clock speed, really doesn't mean anything because, you know, it depends more upon how exactly the hardware is, is set up. So your clock, you know, may take you a thousand clock cycles to execute an instruction for some reason, which is, you know, fairly feasible. But you, the point is that you can never tell from just a raw clock speed as to how, how well your computer performs. So risk order, whatever, we have fetch, fetch and execute cycles for most instructions, which means most instructions require two clock cycles to execute. It means they have a fetch cycle and an execute cycle. Roughly, the fetch cycle is retrieving an instruction from memory, which means you know it's fetching an instruction from memory. Uh, roughly, an execute cycle is it, it looks at that instruction it got from program memory, decodes it, sees what it is, decides what it what to do based on that instruction. So we're going to re refer to that as an execute cycle. For risk five, we also have a write back cycle for the load type instructions, and this is this is a list of, of load type instructions right there. It's the wrong button. Okay, and this is it here. We we'll have a red pen. <laughs> These are the load type instructions. There's five of them. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. So timing issues are uh, vastly important on any computer. The notion here is it's pretty complicated when you first see it. The more you work with it, it 
it becomes kind of second nature. So I encourage people to put the time into doing these problems, doing the example problems and stepping through this. Uh, like I said, it's the time you put into it, it does pay off. So this is an example of our fetch and execute cycle here. Uh, these are these are fetch and execute per instruction, fetch and execute. Obviously, these are non-load type instructions because they're only a fetch and execute. So this here is, is the clock. Uh, we confer to it as a system clock. It's just kind of the master clock for the microcontroller. It's it's controlling essentially a state machine. The state machine here is designed right here, which is uh, this is the state diagram. Essentially, you can see the fetch and execute cycle. So it, it fetches, it transitions unconditionally to execute, and then it either transitions to back to fetch if it's a non-load type instruction, or it, it transitions to execute if it's a load type instruction. And from execute, of course, it, it uh, unconditionally transfers back to fetch. So this is this is the basic uh, state machine. This is where the, this is the state machine the control unit's going to use for at least experiment five. We're going to change this later when we get into interrupts, but we uh, don't have to worry about that now. So the idea is you have to you're going to be executing you're going to be implementing these control units such that it um, we're moving towards implementing all the instructions on the risk 5 So there's some good news is the fetch state. It's exactly the same for every every instruction. And that gets kind of uh, less good when you hit the execute cycle. So the execute cycle, it's one state, but it has basically 8-ish type substates. And then some of those substates have other states. Con not so much states, but conditions associated with implementing the instruction. So essentially to execute the instruction uh, there has to be a, a, a bunch of choices inside that state to essentially decode the instruction. So if you could imagine it's going to be some type of uh, case statement. So the good news here is that uh, you have to implement 40 instructions on this thing. Good news is that many of them are pretty much exactly, or not exactly the same, but very close to being the same. There's only eight ish type different instructions those uh, are where it gets complicated the implementing instructions that that is similar to another instructions not a big deal you will you'll see that when you implement these things so i i threw this in here essentially to remind you that inside the control units they are going to be and during the execute cycle they are going to be decoding the opcodes. So these uh, these are three different instruction types here. So here's an instruction type with one opcode. This has two opcodes, and this has essentially three opcodes. Typically, we refer we refer to this as the opcode. Yet uh, in reality, all three all three of those are opcodes when they have it. But this is the main opcode. So they never change in any given instruction. The thing that, that does change is the field codes. And so essentially the field codes represent either register values or they represent immediate values. But uh, the point being that is that when we're decoding an instruction, we are decoding uh, the opcodes. Sometimes we have to go through all, th all three levels of opcodes to figure out what instruction it is. So just toss that out there. And so this is the the entire uh, risk V architecture. What we're going to be implementing is these two circuits right here. Uh, we're going to implement those, and that's going to give us a working computer. We have every other module except we don't have this branch condition generator, which is which is okay because in this experiment we won't be doing any branching. And recall that a branch is a a conditional conditional jump uh, we will be doing a jump in here but it's unconditional so we can uh, get away without without knowing this so once again um, these these two objects this is what you're going to fill in you're going to get little starter templates from this but I'm going to warn you right now for these inputs don't get rid of them just ass assign them a value such as zero you actually won't be using them in the code but you'll be using it in the next experiment so don't get rid of it so this is experiment five. Um, what we have is two control units, and they they were broke 
broken up into two control units just probably for simplicity and I would like to say one of them is a state machine which implies it has state which implies it has memory the other one is, is a decoder so this is the decoder one this is state machine one essentially this these controls are are state based uh, essentially it has to deal with about uh, eight different op codes to do something in those various states um, there's like I said you've seen before there's only three states in this thing uh, but um, there's uh, some kind of not sub states but parts of those states you have to deal with so these typically speaking these send out control signals with, that have to do with micro operations whereas decoder sends out signals having to do mostly with uh, select signals on on the various muxes throughout the circuit so the the idea is ex experiment five is you're going to assemble the those two these two modules right here you're going to i mean they're already they already work I, I mean they're already there for you you just have to fill them in so it's a decent skeleton you have to fill in the right parts so most of the mod modules are done that you did in previous experiment other things are provided for you what you're going to do is assemble all this stuff make a working computer and then execute a simple program so I, I'm providing the program for you it's it's a program that I think it adds and it reads in the switch values adds a one to it outputs it to the LEDs so essentially this is going to prove that your hardware works if this simple little program works on the board so this is the simple little program and so what we're doing is this is an input port this is the output port it's reading in the switches that are attached to this port and it's it's writing them out this port okay so here here it is it's reading the switch values it's adding one to it it's outputting it and then it's jumping back and doing it again so what you're going to see on your board is a piece of hardware that you know reads in the switches add one adds one to it and outputs it to leds so for example if you put if you turn the first three switches three leftmost switches on that's representative of seven seven plus one is eight it's going to add one to it it's going to turn the first three off and turn the fourth one on just as an example okay so when you what, what happened is this this is the program that's written um, this is the program that's executed by the hardware so this is these are the the instructions in here are the instructions you need implemented in the control units to make this experiment work okay so that's I, I don't know how many one two three four five you got five instructions you're gonna implement five different instructions in this that's all you need to do and not not a super big deal to to implement five instructions the bigger deal is to assemble your hardware and make that work and so um the the wrapper is the uh, very important circuit it allows you to interface your your wrist five microcontroller to the outside world so the outside world for us is going to be the, the development boards the, the development board here has buttons and switches as inputs and it has led cath cathodes and anodes as outputs so we're going to go over this in quite quite more depth later but the idea here is you can put you can put a lot of things into this microcontroller but you can only put in 32 bits at a time same with the output you can take you can output a lot of things from them but you only can output 32 bits at a time so the inputs are controlled by a mux which we'll go over later all the outputs are registered so for the outputs are this just there temporarily we need to register them to make the circuit work so this is just a quick version um, the wrapper works don't touch anything in the wrapper because it works don't change anything if you have a problem with your program it's not the wrapper so the wrapper provided for this experiment is is solid don't change it and um, yep that's about it we'll get more about into the wrapper later um, so once again everything's provided for you 
um, except these two things you get like a starter template that is not filled in structures there you need to fill it in uh, these everything else is given to you we've worked with uh, we've worked with memory register files provided and the wrappers provided so this is um, uh, sort of a long experiment um, the idea is to get started as fast as you can uh, work on it as much as you can um, not so much eight hours at a time but toss an hour here and there out I think that's the best way to do it so there are a lot of the resources for this experiment um, that's not evident what you'll need to do from the experiment uh, anytime you're working anything with microcontrollers at this low level you typically have the cheat sheets in front of you cheat sheets assembler manuals anything you have you have to access those for this experiment that's part of the experiment I think I put a bunch of information in experiment 5 but certainly not enough to get the experiment done you're, you're expected to access all the written resources to, in order to get this done okay and also you know I'm also available to answer questions via email or zoom or whatever okay